Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm back. I talked to a couple of you who said that the last review lecture that I did helped a little bit. So I'm going to be quickly going through. Right now, I'm going to record a quick lecture for the topics from exam one, just as a refresher. And then later on, I'm going to post a video about the topics for the final exam. So let me share my iPad. I hope this works. Um, okay. Hopefully you can see that. I'm gonna go and put this up in the corner. I'm not sure where my video is gonna show up, so I hope it doesn't block anything. Okay, so let's get started with section oh, section one. So what is a fluid? Um a way we can quantify that is comparing a fluid against a solid. So the definition of the book is that a fluid is a substance that deforms continuously when acted on by shearing stress. When acted on by shearing stress of any magnitude. Okay, and then a solid, a solid has transient deformation for a short amount of time. I'll just transient deformation for a short amount of time, but then develops and elastic restoring force that counteracts the applied stress, that counteracts applied stress. So in exa examples of fluids, by this point, you know it's um, gases are fluids and liquids are fluids. Uh, and then just as a review, let's go over stress and strain. So stress, versus strain. A stress is a force that's applied to uh, a material divided by the area. So to material divided by area. And then a strain is the deformation or like lengthening or shortening. It's a de deformation or displacement. So deformation or displacement of material that results from an applied stress. Okay, um, let's go on to dimensions and units. So dimensions and units. So let's go to systems of units. We've got our dimensions, we've got uh, units of mass, we've got length, we've got time, and then we've got temperature. And in SI units, uh, this would be the kilogram, the meter, the second, and then uh, Kelvin. Uh, and then for British units, this will be slugs, this is feet, this is also seconds, and then we've got ranking here. And in, instead of MLT units, you could also do force. So F is also possible. Um, by this point, you know, because of your dimensional analysis skills that have been buffed up through the semester that we have to, we always have to satisfy dimensional homogeneity, homogeneity. I think I spelled that right, of uh, equations. So both sides of the equal sign must have same uh, dimension. Okay, let's get into some, actually before I go on, 
I want to just, th these are some short equations that are really, really important, but they don't, I, I didn't dedicate specific sections to them later in the lecture. So I'm just going to write them up here. Just some quick definitions. So we have density, rho is equal to mass divided by volume. We have specific gravity is equal to rho, the density of whatever you're measuring over a reference uh, density. And that, that is that density, the reference density is usually the density of water at four degrees Celsius, which is 999 kilograms per meter cubed. We have gamma is equal to rho g, so specific gravity. And then quick conversions, one slug is 32.2 mass pounds um, at pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure and then force is equal to tau so shearing stress times area okay now let's go on to the ideal gas law so for the ideal gas law you know it you love it it's pv is equal to nRT, or you could rearrange uh, this, or P is equal to the density rho uh, over the molecular weight times RT. Uh, and you can solve for this yourself if you divide out volume from both sides, you solve for um, moles in terms of density and volume. So you can do, that's something you could easily derive in an exam. Uh, let's do viscosity and stress. Okay, so shearing stress tau is equal to mu times gamma dot. And mu here is your viscosity. And then gamma dot is your rate of shear strain, which means that we can also rewrite this as mu. Let me write that a little better, mu times partial u over partial y. So the shape of your, velo the way your velocity profile changes with increasing height. So to draw this as a bit of a, a diagram for this, we can have our top plate. Oh man, that's a shaky picture. We have a bottom plate. Okay. And if I have my velocity profile that looks a little something like that with this being the direction of increasing y, and I'm pulling this plate along with some force f, um, we can quantify this using some boundary conditions at the fixed and free surfaces. So let's write that out. Boundary conditions at fixed and free surfaces. So You've gone over this a lot at this point. There's a question on the current homework about it, about your boundary conditions. One boundary condition that we always know is that is the no slip boundary condition, which means that the fluid next to the boundary, fluid next to boundary is, uh, we'll say pinned to it so that they have the same velocity. They share same velocity. Okay, um, then we can also quantify the magnitude and directions of the stress. So magnitude and direction of stress. So Newton's, I think it's Newton's second law, the fluid is going to exist, exert, fluid exerts, a small stress on the wall in this direction because the wall is exerting a stress on the fluid in this direction, the way it's pulling it. So while fluid exerts small stress on wall this way, wall exerts stress on fluid in the other direction. Okay, um, let's do Viscosity versus shearing rate. So viscosity versus shearing rate. So for a liquid, we have that the viscosity will decrease with increasing shearing. And for gas, we have that the viscosity increases 
Oh, my bad. Wait, no, that's correct. Okay. This, sorry, let me think of this. Viscosity. Oh, this should be temperature. My bad. So as we heat a liquid up, the viscosity will decrease. As we heat a gas up, the viscosity increases. That might be sheer. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but what we can do is we can write, we can draw a graph for this. Um, so this will be shearing stress, and this will be that will be shear and tau, and this will be du dy. So that's the shearing rate versus your shear stress. Um, and we have two fluids. We'll call that one A. Call that one B. Uh, if you think about which one has the higher viscosity, A has a higher viscosity here because to make the top plate move at the same rate of strain, it needs a greater stress. So I'll write that out. A has higher viscosity to make top plate move at same rate of strain, it needs greater stress. Okay, um, let's talk about compressibility. So we've got something called the bulk modulus, bulk modulus, which is E sub nu, which is equal to one, negative one over the volume times the change in pressure with the change in volume, which we can also rewrite as one over rho times the change in pressure with the change in density. Okay, so for liquid, our bulk modulus will go to infinity, which means that it's incompressible. Um, and then we've got two conditions for gases. If your bulk modulus is equal to P, that's isothermal, or that's the isothermal bulk modulus. And then if your bulk modulus is equal to Kp, this is your adiabatic uh, bulk modulus. So dQ is equal to zero. And if we draw like a uh, pressure versus density graph, this would be rho, this would be P. You can see that as we, starting from here, as we increase the pressure on a gas, the density will increase. So this is a gas versus for a liquid, this is incompressible. As we increase the pressure, the density is gonna stay exactly the same. I forget what this constant is called, but I've written it here as M sub A, and that's the ratio of the volume of gas to the volume of solid. So if, MA is less than 0 0.3, you have an incompressible gas. And if your MA is greater than 0.3, you have a compressible gas. Okay, uh, last thing from chapter one is vapor pressure and boiling. So vapor pressure and boiling. Um, I'm really sorry about my handwriting, guys. I'm writing a little fast because I have to head to the engineering center soon. But um, I wish I could do this live. That way you guys could tell me if my handwriting sucks. Um, okay. So this is a pressure temperature phase diagram, which you guys are going to see a lot more of next year in thermo. Uh, we've divided out our diagram into three regions. This region over here, where there is, uh, if we push our material into a high pressure at a low temperature, this is gonna be solid. This phase is gonna be liquid, and this is gonna be gas. And what we call these lines here, we call them coexistence lines. So coexistence lines. And this is the equilibrium phase. Okay. 
So boiling is boiling is characterized when we for, when we first form bubbles in a liquid. So it's characterized by the formation of bubbles in a liquid. And this happens when PVAP is equal to atmospheric pressure. Uh, and then surface tension. So that's saying that a force tends to minimize the surface area between the minimize the surface area of the liquid to gas interface. So F will minimize surface A surface A between liquid, that's a liquid, and gas. Okay, cool. So that's all of chapter one done. Let's move on to chapter two. Um, so a fluid element will experience uh, certain forces, which we can quantify. So we've got forces exerted on a fluid element, and that will be pressure and gravity. So if we write out Newton's second law for fluids, Newton two for fluids, we've got negative gradient of pressure minus uh, zero, zero, you know, specific gravity. And this is, this is basically your mg term is equal to your rho times acceleration. This is gonna be your mass times acceleration term. And then we know that this uh, pressure gradient, so for a fluid at rest, the acceleration is zero which means that your gradient of pressure with respect, to, um, with respect to your height Z, so partial P over partial Z, is just gonna be your negative, um, your negative specific gravity, which is equal to your negative density times gravity. Okay, so we can also talk about hydrodynamic pressure or force, hydrodynamic, pressure or force versus elevation for liquids and gases. So for an incompressible fluid, incompressible fluid, your specific gravity, which is, you know, um, your density times gravity, that's gonna be constant. And then in that case, your change in pressure is going to be equal to negative gamma times your height h. Or you can expand that out instead of a delta, you can write that your uh, pressure is going to be equal to gamma h plus your original pressure. What this tells us is that pressure will increase as you go deeper, which makes sense because like imagine you're in a swimming pool and you try and swim deeper and deeper and you can feel the pressure, your ears are going to pop. It's because of all those layers of fluid that are on top of you also exerting pressure on you. And then compressible, let me just put bullet points here and write that a little bit nicely. Compressible ideal gas. In this case, you have your gamma as a function of Z. So it varies. Uh, and the formula that you probably went over in class that P is equal to P naught times e to the power of, and I just write that as exp, negative g times the change in height, so z2 minus z1 over your ideal gas constant times the temperature, rt. Okay, great. Um, gauge versus absolute pressure. So gauge versus absolute pressure. Your absolute pressure absolute pressure is equal to your gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. And the thing about your absolute pressure is that it's always going to be greater or equal to zero, always. So if you're solving through a problem and your absolute pressure is below zero, uh, you should go back and see what you did. Um, 
A common problem that you came that you worked with while you were studying chapter two was manometer, manometer problems. So manometer problems. And the strategy for solving a manometer problem, I'm not gonna, I don't have, I didn't write down an example, but the general strategy is that the summation of your pressures and then your gamma H terms must equate. Um, and then you can solve for the unknowns depending on the type of manometer. Solve for unknowns depending on type of manometer. Okay. Um, got hydrostatic forces on planar surfaces. These problems are usually tricky. I had trouble with them. I had a lot of trouble with them. So hydrostatic forces on planar surfaces. Also, I'm very sorry if my handwriting is not that legible. <laughs> um, okay. There's a couple ways that you, that they could uh, that you could ask this type of problem. They could ask you about resultant forces. They could ask you about the center of pressure. They could ask you about how much torque um, you need. Uh, another type of problem was the does the gate open or not open type of problem. Um, how much force is needed? to be applied, uh, all that. All those problems uh, involve hydrostatic pressure on planar surfaces. So the main equation you're gonna use here is that F resultant, FR is equal to gamma times AC times A. And let's go over all those terms. So, Actually, let me let me draw let me draw a diagram first. That'll be your planar surface with area A, um, and then we've got a resultant force being applied here normally, and that's your F R is equal to gamma H C A. H C is going to be the height from this point, uh, which is the centroid of the area. So this is. Centroid. So HC is the height uh, or the vertical distance. Let's write that out. Vertical distance from fluid surface to centroid of area or YC sine theta. Um, we've also got YC, formula for YC is Y naught plus A over two. Um, the center of pressure of a rectangle. So center of pressure of a rectangle. And the equation for that is that Y resultant is equal to your Y centroid plus one twelfth A squared over yc and to think about that just visualize is that if you have a rectangle yc can be up there yr is usually lower so this um what this does is it gives you distance from the surface it gives distance from surface okay uh methodically if you're given like a gate opening or not problem you can say, you can, you, you can check whether a gate will open or not using the torque balance, which you should remember from physics one. So to see if gate opens, use torque balance. Um, and then from my experience with the class last year, uh, take this with a grain, grain of salt usually on the exam this type of problem will be a lot simpler so you're going to have rectangular surfaces and like non-horizontal or like vertical gates 
So it should be, I would, I would still recommend brushing up on these concepts a little bit. Um, just a quick review, torque. So you have, instead of tau, I'm just gonna write little capital T is gonna be FR times Y arm side theta, where Y arm is your fluid depth minus your distance from surface. Last bit from chapter two was buoyancy. So buoyancy problems, um, Archimedes principle. So in this case, you know that the buoyant force is equal to gamma times your volume. And I believe you have a question like this on your current homework as well. So this is essentially what it's saying is the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So this is the weight of displaced fluid. Um, and a quick thing you should note about this is that for compressible fluids inside of compressible in, inside of flexible containers, so for compressible fluids inside of flexible containers, we will change with depth. Um, and so in my office hours for the for this week's homework so far, I've gotten a lot of questions about which fluids properties do we want to use. Um, I would think, I, I like to think, I like to bring it back to conceptual examples. Like if you're thinking through, um, imagine trying to punch or yeah, trying to punch a vat of honey versus a vat of water, right? What you're doing is while you're pushing through it, you're trying, you're pushing out all these honey or water molecules out of the way to make space for your arm to go through. And so in terms of the resulting, the drag force that's being pushed onto your body, um, and then if you're trying to float something, the buoyancy force, it's all based on the properties of the surrounding fluid. The surrounding fluid is what's giving you the drag it's what's giving you your buoyant force you want to use the fluid properties of your bulk fluid okay let's move on to i think the last chapter that you covered for exam one which is going to be chapter three that was really ugly chapter three and this is everything to do with our boy bernoulli so bernoulli equation. There's, um, in order to apply the Bernoulli equation, we have to have some conditions that are met. So conditions when applicable, it's for an ideal fluid. So we have three assumptions. We are assuming that the fluid is incompressible which we know if you're, um, if it's a liquid or a slow moving gas with, that should say moving, slow moving gas with your Mach number less than 0.3. That's what it was, Mach number, I think. Um, you're also assuming steady flow. And then you're gonna assume that it is inviscid in this which means that it has zero viscosity and you know that that essentially means that your shear stress is negligible so shear stress is negligible um so remember our equation for shear stress was tau is equal to mu gamma dot and which means that your tau will be approximately zero if either, let's move this down a little bit, if either you have your viscosity zero for gas, or if your rate of shear strain is approximately zero. So uniform, if you have a uniform velocity profile, um, 
Yeah. You've got several interpretations of the Bernoulli equation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Several interpretations. Um, so you've got one in terms of energy, pressure, and height. So if you're going in terms of uh, pressure, P terms, you've got P plus one half rho V squared plus gamma plus gamma Z is constant. And that means if you're comparing between two points, P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus gamma Z1 is the same thing, but for two. Uh, this is your static pressure. This is your dynamic pressure, dynamic pressure, and this is your hydrostatic pressure. Uh, for energy, in energy terms, you have your P over rho. It's one half. You're, you're, you're dividing out everything by rho. So one half V squared plus GZ. That's constant. Uh, and the way you classify this, this is your pressure work. This is your kinetic energy term. And this is your gravity work. Uh, and then in terms of height, so Z terms, you've got P, this time we're gonna be dividing everything out by gamma. So P over gamma plus V squared over two G plus Z is constant. Um, and this is called your pressure head. head. Um, this is gonna be your velocity head, velocity head. And this is gonna be your elevation head, elevation head. Um, and we can use this Bernoulli equation in specific cases to, you know, just there's specific equations for specific problems. So use Bernoulli equation to solve problems. So one example would be confined flows. And what I'll have is I'll have a big inlet go to a small outlet. Um, we'll call this point one, and we'll call this point two. And we'll have a flow coming in this side with velocity one. We'll say that the cross section of one is A1, cross section of two is A2. And the way I've drawn it, we have A2 is much, much lower than A1. So in this case, we can uh, use the continuity equation. So continuity equation. So rho one a one v one is equal to rho two a two v two, and then if your rho is constant, so it's if if you're looking at an incompressible fluid, in compressible, you can just say that your volumetric flow rate, um, Q, volumetric flow is a one v one. It's also a two V two. So you're just dividing row out of that equation. You're canceling it out. Um, stagnation points. Let's just define them. Stagnation points. So at stagnation points, your velocity is equal to zero. Uh, free jets. That's also something you covered. Free jets. So let's say I have a big that, that should be straight, big that. And then I'll have a little, little opening right there. And this is filled with some fluid. I'll call this top diameter D and the distance from the uh, top of the fluid down to the point here, I'll call that H. What's gonna happen is you're gonna see some streamlines for fluid particles that just go straight through there. Uh, and let's call the end of the opening little d. So if we write out our Bernoulli equation, we have P1, we'll call this one, we'll call this 0.2. So P1 plus one half 
rho v1 squared plus gamma z1 is p2 plus one half rho v2 squared plus gamma z2. And we, we defined our height h is as being z2 minus z1. So you can rearrange this and you'll get one half rho v1 squared plus gamma h is one half rho v2 squared. And then what we can do is we can sub in continuity. So substitute in the continuity equation where v1 a1, so v1 times pi over four d squared is equal to v2 times pi over four little d squared, which means that v1 is equal to v2 is d over big D squared. Okay, plugging all of that back in, you can simplify this and you'll get an expression for v2 as 2gh over one minus little d over big D to the fourth quantity square root. And just a quick note here, if your little, if your uh, ratio of diameters, little d over big D is much less than one. So if your little diameter is way, way smaller than your big one, you know that one minus, or one minus D over big D to the fourth will essentially just be one. And you can think about that mathematically, like if D over D is just say 0.1, like it, your little diameter is a 10th the size of big D, 0.1 to the fourth, is 0 0.0001, I think. Yeah, that's basically nothing. So by the time that you've um, taken that quantity to the fourth power, it'll be negligible. So look for simplifications wherever you can. So siphons, that's another thing. I'll have a big tub of some liquid here. Uh, and I'll have a tube coming out. Cool. Um, and I'll say the surface of the liquid is like there. Let's say the height between the top of the tube and the surface of the liquid, we'll call that H. So H is this height right here. And we're going to look at streamlines between point one out here and point two right there. It's going to look a little something like that. Okay, um, putting in your Bernoulli equation, you have P plus one half rho V tubed, tube squared plus gamma Z is equal to P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus gamma Z1. P1, you're, it's uh, open to the atmosphere. So that's gonna be zero. And then V1, since it's so much bigger, you're not gonna see any, any, the velocity change of that top fluid is gonna be about zero. And subbing this in, we'll get P is equal to negative one half rho V tube squared minus gamma H. Okay. Um, there's, when using siphons, there's a phenomenon called siphon failure. So siphon failure happens because of low, of low pressure. So you can have tube collapse or you can have cavitation where your pressure is less than your vapor pressure. Um, okay, we've got, you can consider horizontal flow. versus flow with gravitational effects versus flow with gravitational effects. So if it's horizontal, I mean, you can quite easily see if it's horizontal, Z1, Z2 is gonna be the same. So Z1 is equal to Z2. You can cancel the gamma Z terms. Um, you can combine the Bernoulli equation with the continuity equation. So combine Bernoulli, Bernoulli equation with continuity. Um, 
And this is this is specifically for tubes with variation in size. So your continuity equation V1, A1 is equal to V2, A2. So V2 is equal to, or V1, V1 is equal to V2, A2 divided by A1, just like what we did up here with the free jets. Um, and you have your Bernoulli equation, P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus gamma Z1 is equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus gamma Z2. And then you can just take this expression and sub it in for V1, or you can rearrange, sub it in for V2, whatever. Uh, a quick mental check you can do when solving Bernoulli expression problems is that if you're, if, if there's a, if, there, if one of your areas is smaller than the other, so let's say if A1 is smaller than A2, V2 or V1 is going to be greater than V2 and P1 is going to be less than P2. Um, okay, last thing is going to be pressure variation across streamlines. Pressure variation across stream lines. Uh, so curvature effects. You've got, okay, let's, let, let's write out the Bernoulli equation perpendicular to the stream lines. So Bernoulli equation perpendicular to stream lines. You've got pressure plus rho times the integral. That should be a rho. Rho is integral v squared over that curly r thing. Um, is dn plus gamma z is the constant. And then for horizontal flow, p or dn is equal to negative rho v squared over the radius of curvature, the curly r, radius of curvature. Um, your radius, that should be a curly r, your radius of curvature will increase uh, as your dp over dn becomes less negative because your pressure is going to increase. Therefore, your pressure will increase. So an example would be, let's take a vortex. So I've got a point A in the middle of the vortex. I've got little swirly. Oh, man, I should draw that better. Swirly bits going all around it and going this direction. I'll say point B is out here. Because of this, as your radius of as your radius of curvature is increasing, so is your pressure. This one we just wrote here. So pressure of B is going to be greater than pressure of A. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's all the topics covered for exam one. I'll be making another review video for the final exams chapters, and I think the link that I put out to the exam two content is still valid for a little bit. So yeah, good luck with um, everything guys. And if there's any questions, you can hit us up on the discord or email professors, TAs um, and yeah, good luck.